report it here. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first Guild Zoom class for 2022-23. And uh, there's going to be, I think, 19 classes every Thursday night. And we'll, we'll skip only one night. So the schedule will be uh, posted so you can see everything. And I want to welcome you uh, to the Guild new website. So what I'm going to do is share my screen so you can see how this is put together. <laughs> so this was a learning experience. So if anybody wants to get into uh, creating and designing a website, don't do it because <laughs> this is really difficult. But I had, because of my geeky background, I had an absolute ball putting this thing together. So uh, I absolutely, I did have help. And it, it's from a, uh, a company back in uh, Chicago and it's called Excel Digital Group. And they earned their money because I'm such a newbie at this. Um, they had to explain everything. And so it was difficult. So this is the home page. So up here like that, and then you page down a little bit. And it tells you about our guild. And that picture there was taken. There's Jerry Chris. <laughs> He's right there. And my co-founder, Valerie Anderson. Uh, these are the first, very one of the very first guild meetings. And we started in, in 2009. And if you could look down a little bit further, I have some uh, just hello. These are all the clubs that are part of our, our organization. And then I'll be blogging for the first time. So if you look at, this is just the homepage. There's not about there, not much about there. So you go to about, and that tells a little bit about what we're about, which is, we're supposed to be saying that. And that's a picture of one of our first classes in the fly tying room. And that's the room that we convert a little bit. We move the, all of the, the couches out of the way and we set up tables in the middle of the room and we tie. And so uh, hopefully we'll be able to have some face-to-face -face meetings soon. And then this talks just a little bit. I'll let you read that on your own just like welcome everybody. And then here's Valerie and I, we're the only two that are, that are uh, doing most of the organization right now. And with help of, uh, with uh, uh, Kathy Hamilton and anybody else that I can ask a question, <laughs> that's, that's who's doing it right now. So then if you go to club leaders, this was a lot of fun to do because everybody that um, is, teaching this particular year, I had them uh, send me a, uh, a little bio. So if you if they look at the little arrows on either side and you can page through those people. And then, uh, and if you wanna know about them, who, what they're doing, here's Jerry, you just click on them and it tells you a little bit about that instructor. So uh, that's, that's what the, um, the club leaders are. And as we have new instructors that give me their information, I'll be adding that to the club leaders. And then the next screen is the club meetings. Now the meetings, this is again what we had. This is where we had quite a few more people that were coming in. Uh, so we can see pretty much 18 tires if we have to squeeze it. And, uh, and when we get ready to have start this again, I'm going to have to have some help fix, uh, doing the hybrid stuff. So the hybrid part of the meeting is I want to be able to have face-to-face -face meetings when everybody's comfortable with it and also have another camera that can show the people that are attending that, that uh, are through the Zoom uh, part. So that's, that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to skip this class part right now because that's the most complex part to do. And that's our blog. So if you want to get into a chat with the blog spaces there, I just got, I just made three of them. And one of them is of course, all about the expo. You can click on that. 
Then on the fly patterns, that was a lot of fun because over the years, I, uh, I asked John Kraft, how much of your website can I use? And so John was very kind and he said, use whatever you want. So you'll see a lot of these patterns and stuff when you get, get to them, you'll see that they are John Kraft's uh, pictures. So if you look at something like if you just click on hoppers and beetles, you don't get the pictures, but you just download what it is. And it comes right down to your, uh, to your computer and you can tie that particular fly. So that's what the patterns are. Now the gallery is something different. And it's been suggested that all the, these are the flies that we've tied at the meetings over the years. And what we wanna do is slowly replace these pictures with pictures of the fly plates that we've designed and the guild members have tied the flies and then we donate them to our, um, our expo and to FFI National to sell. Uh, if you're a nonprofit, we'll make a plate for you. So when we get ready to do that, that's where the gallery uh, pictures will come when I get a lot of those pictures for you. Under class schedule, this is what's gonna save me a lot of time. And this time is, you can see that right now, this is the meeting that's on. So there's, there's not, uh, not really much information there. But if you look at down here, uh, Christmas flies, I don't have that yet. But uh, the class two, which is gonna be Jeff Perrin, if you click on that guy, tells you a little bit about what it is. You click on class two and it tells you a little bit about it. And then you can, this is where you download the um, handout. So what's really nice about this is that I don't have to send these handouts to every person and have to group them because it's, it's such a big deal. You can add it to your own calendar if you want. So that's there. Tells you again what's what's there. And then uh, this, is, this is where uh, your class is. So you click on class two. And see this little button right here? I love that button. So you click on the button and wherever you live in the United States, it tells you what time you have to be there in order to be at our class. And uh, I'm gonna use this uh, on a couple of other websites that I'm designing. We're designing a uh, expo website will be brand new and the council website will be brand new. So anybody that's from any of these places in the United States, I don't have worldwide map here, but uh, you can even, you know, if you're in Puerto Rico or Hawaii, uh, it tells you what time to be there. So that's, uh, I'm pretty excited about that. And I know that if I ask you where you're from, I'll say, oh, you're from, oh, you're how far away are you, right? So this, and then you can add it to your calendar. That's what class two is all about. So when you look at the classes, if you look at the all events, you can go back and just page through it and see which class you want to go to because the list will be there. So uh, that's about all we got for our, I'm going to go ahead and close this. If you look, I go back at the class schedule, if I can get the month view. If you look at the month view, you can see which, when the classes are. When we start having face-to-face -face meetings, you'll see Saturday classes come up and that'll, that'll also tell you what's happening. So when you subscribe to this website, you'll automatically get the notice for the meetings. And that way I send, I put that on the web and you guys can look at it and find out just where you, what class you wanna go to. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. And it will save a lot of time uh, when we get ready to start having these classes. And I think it's worth the effort because it's caught on pretty good for now two years. This is, this is the beginning of year three. And so I'm really happy. Uh, and there's 29 of you tonight. Wow, that's really good. I'm gonna pull up the chat window. Now I may not have, I may not, I may miss some of the chatting, but I will try my best to do that, to catch it if I have something that I need to do. So I'm gonna go down here and go to speaker view. 
and uh, I've got Gerald. <laughs> I don't know why I don't got this all good stuff. Hi, Gerald. <laughs> you, uh, let me pull this up here. Um, there we go. So I'm going to uh, introduce you to, uh, we're going to just do some soft tackles, easy stuff. The handout that I send out has a list of all the different uh, uh, colors. Now, what, what you have is a sheet like this or similar to that in the handout that uh, John Kreft helped me make. Uh, I think it was quite a long time ago. So different soft tackles have different colors to catch different fish a different kind of year, October, you know, green drake hatch or whatever. So what, what, what I wanted you to be able to look at is have your, um, your list along with John's, this is the list that was actually posted right here. Now you'll be able to say what size, what color to imitate which hatch. And I, I got confused of which one. So John helped me, uh, helped me design that particular chart. And of course, this is John Kraft's handout on how to tie the fly. So that's what we're gonna do tonight. Any questions? Nobody's got questions. Okay, well, I'm gonna move over to a different camera. And this, is the camera, uh, which is basically a materials camera that has uh, the focus is, it doesn't change. It, it just stays one, <laughs> it doesn't go in and out and, and disturb everything, but it's where that if I've got something specific that I'll be able to put uh, that, that particular uh, pattern and all the materials here. Now the main material for this particular fly, of course, is the Hungarian partridge. And if you look at this partridge, this one I got at Blue Ribbon Flies in Montana. And you look all of these feathers along this edge right here, the smallest ones, that's where I have other capes that are picked to death. All of this is gone and this is still here. I'll do something else with it. But all of these feathers right here are the ones that I used for the soft tackles. So I'll change cameras again. And we're gonna look at the fly. This is, I'm gonna move over here and look, I can still see what I'm doing because this camera has um, a, a screen on it that flips out and I can, then I can see the, um, I can see what I'm doing and see what you're, you can see. This is the fly we're gonna tie tonight. So I'm gonna take that off, start over. We'll start with hooks. I got a pretty good deal the other, the other day. I went to the fly fisher's place and uh, they have some new guys at the shop. And this is my favorite hook this TMC 102Y and they had a mound and a half in a box outside the shop in a tray, 50% off. Well, that's the best, that's the best deal. <laughs> that's better than my shop deal. So I bought the, everything that was there <laughs> and then there is size 13. So that's one thing. Then I have another uh, system that I want to show you tonight. And that's my, uh, let's see if I can turn this right side up. This is a B box. So what I do when I buy the, uh, a, I buy these in boxes of a hundred. So what I do is I cut out the, uh, the top of the box and I put it in this box. So then I can have them in order from the different sizes. So from the smallest, the, you don't have to have them in order, but I do, it's weird. So this is the way I store those. So I can open each one of these individually when I get ready to tie a fly. So that's another little handy thing that I do. 
Then I have these little guys. And that's easy to take the hooks in and out of them. I, I have four of these, depending on how many flies I'm tying and what sizes. And I put little stickers on them to make sure I can remember what sizes in that particular can. So tonight I'm going to uh, use this uh, t this uh, 102Y that is uh, a little bigger size than some of the ones on that handout because it's easier for me to tie it when I'm doing a demo. <laughs> and it's easier for you to see it too. But you tie the fly the same. Uh, when you get down to a size 20, if you're challenging to do that, then um, yeah, good luck with that. I'm, I'm, uh, I go about as far as an 18 and then I'm kind of shut down. So uh, this right here is uh, Beavis. And that's what I like. Uh, sometimes this particular fly, I am using this because that's the one I have, but I have a lots of different threads. And whenever I need a color, I just decide to whatever color I need. And it, it does matter. Thread does matter. But because I have so many different colors and so many that I end up uh, needing, I'm just going to use them until they break or they're not usable anymore. <laughs> But this particular one I like because it's um, it's uh, really, really tiny. So I'm going to put on my goggles here. I don't know if you can see that, but anyway, I've got uh, some magnifiers so I can see better. So you start this guy with the thread a little bit away from the hook eye. And I think one of the most important parts of these small flies is when you're tying for, for yourself or someone else and uh, they can't get the tippet through the hook eye. So making sure you don't cover up that hook eye for yourself and anybody you're tying for. And my dear, dear sweet husband, he doesn't like that. What I, what I do is is uh, you make sure you, your starting point, Al Beatty uh, has told us many, many times, there's your stopping point. So when you get that far, yeah, you're going to get a little bit closer to what you're doing. So the other method I have that is really uh, pretty easy is when I'm doing a buy-out body, I have these little stickers. And they're basically post-its. So what I do, if I'm going to do uh, six of these flies, I take uh, and strip off from the main uh, turkey feather. I strip it off and stick it to one of these post-its. That way, I know I've got enough of those off of there at the right size and length for the fly that I'm tying. So that's the way I, I do that. And of course, during a demo, you don't want to uh, get messed up where you're trying to fumble with a with a piece of material and you, you're going, oh, I can't get to that material, it's yucky. <laughs> and so I, I can always just pick up another one. So now you've got this long piece of buy it body and it's a little bit too long because when you start wrapping, you're going to end up with too much. So you just cut off just a little bit of this guy because it's for a longer hook shank. And then you take this guy and it's got an edge to it. I like to have the edge pop up. And then you just lay it up against there and tie down on it. It doesn't even matter if it twists around anywhere. It just doesn't matter. So keeping it um, in a certain position, just wrap it down, it doesn't matter. So when you hold it, hold it so the little edge is towards you. And I clip it with my fancy little pliers. And then you can use your handy dandy bodkin and put it over there e either way you want. Doesn't matter. Because you can, if you're careful, you won't muck it up. So this came out where the edge is forward. So the spine part won't pop up. It'll be flat. If you turn it the other way, this little uh, 
spine will pop up on the top. It's just a different tie. In this case, because the skinnier part of the, the barb is, is going to lay over top of that part that pops up. So now you've got a very smooth body right there. You guys see this okay? And then you just drop your head fed down and behind it. Once you got it secure, and I turned, turn this upside down, make sure I've got it wrapped down and I let it go. Hopefully it doesn't spring back and ruin the demo. Then you've got this little tag sitting out here. You just come in here with your scissors, clip it off, and hopefully you don't clip your thread. Now I've got to figure out where am I going to start this, this underwing. And this is what carries the bubbles. What's neat about this stuff is this is crinkled Zelon. And I'll show you what that looks like. This guy is crinkle, crinkled, crinkled Zelon. And you can also use... Uh, um, I use, I like the uh, Montana uh, yarn. So anything that's crinkly, that looks like this, that will hold bubbles, doesn't matter what the maker is. I just happen to like the stuff I get from Blue Ribbon Flies. So what I do, is wrap that around, pull it down. Now I'm gonna gauge where I want I got enough body from here to here. I got a little bit and I can save a little material by doing this. Now, some of our tires are so talented. They don't need to leave this part right here. I do because I don't trust myself. So I'm gonna move it just a little bit farther forward so it's not too far back. And that way I can keep it right up on top because that's what you want. Tie down on it. I use my thumb, this thumb right here, to hold this because I'm getting uh, my old age is catching up with me a little bit. I'm a little shaky now. So I use my thumb to help me steady my hand. Because steadying the hand when you're tying is probably another thing that we're really trying to be able to get to. So now you've got this dab right here. And I, you put, if you pull it straight, then when it puffs up, it'll be too short. So you got to make sure that you don't make it too long or too short. So you kind of say, well, it's going to end up about like that and cut it off. And if it looks too long, yeah, it looks a little bit longer. You can just shave it a little bit. That's about it. So now you've got your body and your, your uh, now you're going to get the next thing is this, I have pre-prepared my soft tackles. So I don't have to take the time to do that. This is just a soft tackle um, from that partridge. And then I pull all these back. Now what's really cool about soft tackles is first of all, they catch fish. The second is that our instructor, Jerry Chris, who's not here tonight, uh, is going to do a soft tackle class that is going to show you another way to tie down these feathers. So what I do is I just pull out about how much I think I'm going to need, and then I'm going to trim this off. You can see that. I'm going to leave a little bit of a stem there. Now I'm gonna tie this down. This right here ends up being your tying point. If you can see the tie-in point. 
Lay that down. Tie down on the feather. Now I have my fancy hackle pliers from Radio Shack that's probably out of business by now. And this is an electrical clip is all. I'm gonna pull it back and hang on to these feathers and let them slide through your fingers. Make sure you get all of them. And when you come around, it's not one on top of the other. It's just side by side with a little bit of space. So when you get, if you've picked the right size feather, you, you're not going to crowd that eye right here. It's going to be, uh, you're going to have plenty of room to make that head. This looks like one that might be uh, just right for catching fish. Got a couple of fibers there. Couple more wraps. I don't think that'll come undone now. Trim this guy. And there we go. I build up a little bit of a head here. A lot of you have uh, seen me tie this fly before because we did it last year. And I wanted to tie it as the first class because I got to get my, uh, what do you call it, your mojo working? <laughs> and the mojo is part of this whole deal is if you haven't tied in a while as a demo, which I guess this is a uh, two and a half years, you, you got, you got a little bit of a, uh, you got to get, get things going again. Like you, I mean, once I've done with that, get rid of that guy. And I have this, uh, this new material that Al Beatty told us about this stuff right here, this head cement that we used to use this for our horses. And uh, it turns out this stuff is really, really good for tying cement. So even my past has caught up with me. And what I did is I cut off a lot of the fibers on the brush because I wanted to get really, really tiny drops there. And that's the first fly. Any questions? I can switch cameras here. Nicely done, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl, and appreciate all of your hard work. Uh, John Page in Medford, <clears throat> I'm just going to offer a comment. I got yes, the please. I got the new book by uh, uh, Tim uh, Camissa. Well, mm -hmm. I've had it for several months. I read through it and I said, "Holy cow! I can't do all this stuff." I just got through reading it second time this week. Yeah, and my attitude is, I can do that. <laughs> I got so much more out of the second reading than I did the first. Well, and I love the books too. Uh, I'm I'm a book hound, <laughs> and uh, we we have so many great books that are here that we didn't have before, and all these professionals. For sure. Oh my gosh, they've done such a good job. We're gonna have uh, we're gonna have uh, the new Bayfly book that's gonna be up there. He's gonna be at the expo and uh, signing books and you'll be one of the one of the uh, that new one I think John's already bought his right John <laughs> yeah he's going yeah I started reading it it's um uh, I've actually had people uh, want to purchase that book and it's been out of print for several years so it's Spay and D flies uh, by John Shuey and he just in September October Last, yeah. last this fall uh, published a expanded version of it and then i've i haven't made it all the way through 
but it's so far so good. Well, Speak that it. title again, please, John. I well, the new on, one. I'll get it. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it out of my cabinet right here. Yeah, the new one just has uh, spay flies. Mentions a few D flies, but basically it's all on spay flies, and you get a lot of history of the area. And John was hoping people. Yeah, that's the old them. book. Uh, well, no, the new one is is history. What's the new one? There's the new one right there. Yep. Spay yeah. flies, their construction and materials. Yeah. Okay. If anybody wants the old book, I have one extra copy. If anybody's interested in that, they can get me in touch with me. Um, any other questions about what's going on? I see that uh, Beth's has got some uh, go to the month view rather than the list view, and you can uh, get the entry for class number one because uh, the list view is we've already started. <laughs> so that's a good hint. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to go back uh, and I'll tie another version. Pardon my uh, goggles. This is uh, so I can actually see the fly to dry. <laughs> and uh, I'll go to another camera here. Go back to our video capture camera. And we'll start another one. So I hope that uh, little chart that's included in the handout is something that you guys uh, can use depending on where you're going uh, and what hatch is going on. The green drake version really, really works good. And uh, and I think uh, John, Mr. Kreft can comment on how to fish this thing. It was his wife that turned me on to putting a goop on it and fishing fly. You want to do that while I tie, John? Sure, I can do that. Yeah, just go ahead and... Yeah, we just um, came about this this fly. Actually, um, the history, um, I was honored to have John Shuey add this, it's called the River Keeper Soft Tackle Cripple. Um, in his 50 flies of Oregon that he came out with last year. Uh, but it's just a dry fly. So many people use soft tackles and swing them and they're just under the surface, but that's not how we fish this. So we fish it uh, a dead drift dry fly and use a product, a desiccant called frog's fanny. And the reason we like frog's fanny is because it has a brush. And the brush, you can put it into all of the fibers and get them puffed up. Uh, <clears throat> and then just pop it out there. So if you go to my website, I think that I probably have been, there's a new improved version of the fly pattern sheet that Sherry sh shared with you. But it's on my, uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm the, uh, operator, owner, operator of the River Keeper Flies website. And just put in the search bar on the soft tackle crippled and that should take you to the fly. But I, this is probably the second dry fly that I put on. The first one I'd put on as a sparkle done and then use this soft tackle cripple and tie it in a variety of ways. So it could be a Sherry's tying it tonight with uh, buy out body or just a, a regular dubbed body for the for the green drake I like a, a dubbed body and then I put a, a ribbing in it as well so seems to be pretty effective for us yep I can't can't do without it on the metolius <laughs> it's not happening it's absolutely important and, Sherry, uh, this biot is uh, it's the comes off the front edge of that big yellow feather that you held up earlier. That's correct. Yeah, thank you. And I, I got a I got a hint I probably should share with you guys when it comes to that uh, 
that uh, hanging on to those guys because the the feather is is not all parts of the feather are equal. And uh, I'll explain it to you. I'll show you. So I uh, I cheat. <laughs> Basically, I cheat. You look at the feather. Here's the feather and see how long these are right here. Well, if you if you start at the very end of the feather, they're too short. So I, I've got some handy dandy choppers. I just cut off the feather. So then it exposes all these longer feathers. Pull that up. So when you pull them off, you don't muck them up. Because see, they're really stuck together. There's two of them in a row usually. It's hard to get them off of there. You can see this. So I stick on a bodkin in there and then grab it and pull. Now you'll see there's a bunch of this stuff hanging out here. So I just make sure that I get rid of that because it hangs up on your thread. So you just cut that guy off. So then it looks like this. And Thank you so, for the clarification. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. So uh, I have a lot of these hanging around with only half the feather because the other half is, uh, I don't, I haven't found where I can use this for any of the flies, this upper part here. The flies that I, I've tried using these for the soft tackle and it doesn't work. You have to use this side right here. So there's something else that this is used for, but I don't tie a fly that does that. So I know that it's out there because I know Al Beatty could probably tell us what we use the other half of the feather for, but I haven't tied a fly like that before. So anyway, now I'm going to go back to the Zelon. I noticed that Blue Ribbon Flies has a sale going on on the Zelon. And that, that, that this is a uh, an olive color, so I'm going to use an olive uh, olive uh, zelon. They've got a sale on this going on right now. If anybody's interested, you can see this. It's crinkly, and I don't know if there's a big difference between the crinkly stuff and the more straight. I'll show you what that looks like here. And uh, the straight stuff, it looks like this. This is the improved micro Zelon, but it's really straight. So I don't know if you use, uh, this is what the straight looks like. You can see the difference. It is much straighter. So if you wanted to use this kind of, uh, of fiber, you would use it and maybe be better for wrapping. So as you can see, when you when you wrap that, it's going to stretch out a little differently. So I don't know exactly what I want to use this, but I thought it was really cool. So I got some when I was there, <laughs> but I'm not using it on my soft tackle. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this guy up. So I really like having all the colors because I never know when uh, a color will change the way something fishes. They say that's the last thing that they look at. But I'll tell you what, I know for a fact it makes a big difference if you've got the right color. And I tied uh, several dozen of these one time uh, for Eric and the wing was too white. It, it didn't fish. It's just like, okay, so what's wrong with this fly? He says, well, the Zelon's the wrong color. <laughs> okay, so uh, I still have those if anybody would like those flies. Um, I have lots of soft tackles with the wrong color Zelon underneath them and they don't catch fish. <laughs> the straight Zelon works good for uh, trailing shuck. 
Yes, right. That's right. I think that's called for in a lot of patterns. Thanks, Jim. So I have another part of the the uh, another part of this um, this partridge. It has, if you look at it, it's towards the center. It's got some dark, modely looking things, and I really like that. Now, whether it makes any difference, I have no idea. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna tie this uh, olive color with uh, with this darker feather towards the middle. I'm gonna go ahead now. This feather might be a little bit too long for this fly, but I bet it still fishes anyway. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this off. Little thing. So at the expo, we have a few demo tying spots left. I think we're, might be up to 200 so far, but uh, it, it was, uh, at 180 or something like that. So we still have uh, a few spots left. I'll be tying at the expo and uh, probably doing something different than soft tackles because I usually tie them all the time. So I haven't figured out what I wanna do yet, but uh, it might be uh, something that's a little more challenging and uh, something different. I have a, fly that I'm going to tie at Al's, uh, in Al's class. That's a, um, it's a streamer pattern. And uh, I have lost my bodkin somewhere. Of course, you, you lose those things. Oh, there it is. I like this bodkin and I picked it up from a, a uh, estate sale. It's got this little fluffy thing on top of it it's like the i don't know why i like it so much but the handle's really long and i can usually find it if it's on my tying bench and so what i do is i use the bodkin to pull up these trapped fibers because fibers want to get wrapped around each other and see how i've been picking at that a little bit and see how those fibers just come bouncing right out that really does help so that looks pretty good. See, I don't know if you guys can see the color on this guy, but um, looks like I picked the right size and I'm not too close to the hook eye either. I am thrilled that I didn't do that and muck it up during a demo with this many people watching. <laughs> It's like, oh, can you get past that? Well, it's it's hard, but I'm thrilled that we've got so many tires now that have going down this Zoom road. And uh, there was one conversation I was having with one of these guys was saying, well, you know, is, are we going to stop doing this? Well, no, we're not, because it turns out that it's a really good method of being able to bond in the winter time which is when we tie anyway i'm going to show you my other favorite tool which is this this little guy and you can guide this this half hitch right down to exactly where you want it go as you go forward you can lay in another one so if you have a if you're really worried about pushing fibers back far enough and you need an extra help to get this head uh, latched down so it doesn't come apart, then this tool right here is really handy. When it comes in a set of three with different sizes. So I am gonna go ahead and cut this off. Now I know uh, John Kreft, my buddy, he puts, uh, uh, some sort of a head cement on the body. If you do a, um, a buy it body. And I dutifully forgot to do that tonight. So what I usually do is, and I think it's in the directions too. 
um, I don't know for sure, but before you put all the rest and finish the fly, you uh, put that uh, head cement on the body and it, and it basically makes the fly a little lot more durable. So let me go change. Uh, Actually, that. I use Zappa Gap. I've got it on the screen right now. Oh, let's see that. Let me. Uh, so it's a brushable Zappa Gap. And so I, oh, I put, a, put a coating of thread down. And then before I wrap a bia over, I just put a little bit of that on and that just keeps the bia nice and strong so the fish doesn't get it. So uh, that was the missing link in my demo tonight. <laughs> so- uh, What are your favorite colors for the Z-Long? Oh, olive. Well, uh, depends on the fly. If you look at the chart, because I like this olive and, and I like uh, this, um, let's see if you can, you can see that. And I like this, uh, kind of, it's kind of a, it, it's called uh, Adam's gray. So if, depending on the fly you're gonna imitate, if you look at that chart, there's all kinds of different, whatever's hatching, you're gonna match up that color. And then you'll look down that chart, you'll find, see that brown is there. So here is uh, a Z lawn that uh, is brown. So I've got this box, this full of different colors. So the colors, the colors are, uh, I, I really believe that, uh, Color is really, really important. <laughs> and so doing that, uh, let me remove the spotlight, there we go. So the color is very, very important. I'm gonna take these out. And it's more important than when I realized. So uh, this, is, this is the box that has all the dubbing in it <laughs> with all the different colors. And then um, there's some here that I really like. This one is uh, called Caddis Amber. I don't know if you can see that. I like that color. So if you think about the fly and the color of the natural bug, you match that. And that's what it'll, I really does make a difference because uh, the one that I, I, my favorite one that we use all the time is of course, um, the one that's um, for uh, a, a blue wing olive, which is really, really important. So the, the favorite fly, don't leave the river unless you've uh, fished that uh, canary yellow body. <laughs> it really does work. <laughs> yeah, it's something that, uh, yeah, we, we need a lot of those all summer. So, and I might just add, Sherry, that when I tie the fly, I match the Zilon color to the color of the wing of the insect that I'm trying to imitate. Oh, so that's why the chart looks the way it is, huh? <laughs> so the underwing is is the important piece, and so you use a um, another another feather for your for your. Uh, for your soft tackles. And you use uh, this, um, is it these from this, uh, this wing feather right here? Right, I use the yeah. covert feathers from a mallard wing. Yeah. And those are on the leading edge. Uh, and the main reason is because ducks float and partridge don't. Oh, exactly. And so the, the, the structure of the, of the feather for a, a duck is a lot different than the Hungarian partridge. I used to tie all of them with Hungarian partridge. And now I, I usually tie them with the mallard unless it's a, a fly that's going to imitate, for example, a, a March brown, then I'll use the Hungarian partridge for that because of the brown. But the the structure of the feather. And actually that's what's added on my website. I go through that process and show exactly where these feathers come from. 
So is there another feather that you used besides that in the partridge for your soft tackles? Uh, for, for some of the blue wing olives, I'll use a green wing teal, which is a little bit darker done. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it makes a difference though. I think it looks cool, but um, I think if you just tie them with the with the mallard wing, the covert fret feather from the mallard wing, that would probably be just as good. And so you and just even the even the the uh, green drakes, I use the the mallard feather too. All right. Well, uh, if you guys look at the schedule and see the different topics. Now, not all of the um, handouts are populated on the website yet. And that's because sometimes I have them and I have to wait a little bit. And as I get ready for each presenter, then I have to uh, upload that um, or upload or put it on the website. And uh, that's that's new. <laughs> now, this is going to be kind of new stuff, right? And uh, uh, I got it. Let's see. There we go. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just do a speaker view. There you go. That is which one is that, John? That's one of Eric's uh flies. It's a cicada. Oh Eric Eric Steele. <laughs> yes. Oh, so that's right. You're tying. Uh, John is tying flies for uh, my husband Eric's uh, trip to Argentina. So there's some flies that need to be with him when he goes, and so that's a beautiful fly. My goodness. Did you already have that pattern? No, I picked it up off of a Google search. Oh, okay. I like Jim's fly. Can you spotlight his yeah, fly, me, Sherry? Yeah, let me uh, spotlight him. Oh, look at that. Is that from Shuey's book? Hey, Jim. Can you talk about the fly? You're mute. You're muted. Hello, Jim. Hello. <laughs> he can't. Yeah. Okay. There he is. Yeah. Talk yeah. about this fly. Yeah, this one I got from. Um, it's in this book. Steelhead oh, fly yeah. tying. My uh, Hogan. Hogan and Howard. Yeah. And it's this one in particular is called a uh, purple and bronze spay. Ah, beautiful. The uh, one of the things you get from from reading in John's book is how a lot of our what we call spay flies should be really called spay style fly rather than a spay fly because the true spay flies um, they're a little different than what most of us tie <laughs> in particular uh, let's see if I go to if I go to uh, this one what's different somewhat is there probably would be more ribs and quite often they would reverse wrap the ribs and then when they forward wrap the hackle they always left one small rib either a uh, uh, an oval tinsel of some kind and they would go through the hackle on the way up so that all the ribs would line up but the hackle would be crossing over 
those ribs and it, but that last one would lock down those feathers. Are you going to tie that in at the expo so we can take a look at how you're doing that? <laughs> well, I, I did one and I don't have it with me, but it, well, it's downstairs in a frame. It's the Christmas fly, <laughs> okay. but it violates the spay flies because the spay flies were often somber in color. And after Sid Glasso and a few of the others got involved and, and Johnson and a couple of them, they started going with more colorful and brighter patterns. But this one actually has, underneath there, it's, it's got an orange on the back, one third, and then it's got seal fur, purple seal on there. And then it's, I used one of the, of the hackles from uh, Spay Hackle. Jim, the so, title of that book again, please. Oh, yeah, it's Steelhead Fly Tying Art and Design by De Deck Hogan and Marty Howard. Thank you. And he does great photography and step by steps in it. So you really see the detail. And he explains pretty good on the steps. There's a few things that uh, you, you, if after you've tied for a while, you find out I've got an easier way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but the one thing is that, that differs in a lot. The way you do the bronze mallard, usually you would take your, your bronze mallard feather and you take a right and a left, and then you bring them together to form that tent. And some people tie them on one at a time. Some people tie them on, they get them together and hump them so that you get this curvature to it and try to do it all both at the same time. And after a while, you either master it or you don't. And if you don't, then you go to taking a feather like this, pulling it out so that it's like that. And then you would cut those off. And then you would fold it. And then you would mount it on the top. And a lot of the old spay flies, rather than having a curvature that comes down, were actually canted upwards more so that it would look more of almost at an angle like that, mm -hmm. rather than what, what we steelheaders now, they like to think in terms of having this thing hug in the body as much as possible. So there is a, you pick this up in Shuey's book about the original spay flies, and then you have the, the you know, classic spay, and then you have spay-like and, and spay influence patterns that uh, we've come to really use in the Northwest, especially for steelhead, because uh, they steelhead tend to like some brighter colors now and then. Thank you. This is, That's there's, great. there's a couple other ways of folding these hackles to get that, but the difference between this one and this one is, is when you look at the very thing, you got those two edges coming together, and when you look at it this way, you don't have that coming together so much. It's more blunt, but you get use of more of your bronze mallard. By, by locating those feathers that have. Yeah, Jim, we got a question uh, that you can answer. <laughs> uh, Beth is asking, are you still able to buy mallard? Oh yeah. Uh, bronze mallard is not protected. If you got somebody who hunts, that's the best way to get them because then if they will give you the skin, 
you can pick the right and the left because what you have to do is match a right and a left from the, from the same bird. And what you're trying to do is, let's see, you, you're trying to, you're trying to, uh, you know, you've got your, your rights and your lefts here. And what you want to try to do is. Here, let me spot you, spotlight you again. So I can see it. There it is. Yeah. You, the bronze mallard is on the flank, upper part of the back, and it gets darker up here, this bronzy color up at the top. And when you get these feathers, you want to try to match them for curvature. Turn it this way. You want to get another one that matches it for the way the color goes. But some of them have this, in this gray spot down here, that's called the sweet spot on this feather. There's a, see the little gray, gray spot in here? That's a sweet spot. If you try to mount up here where you don't have that sweet spot up on the top here, there, down here, it's not that gray spot isn't right there as much as down below it won't work, but you can, when you get to that spot, use this other technique of folding those bronze mallards. The other uh, source of bronze, you can buy them. You, most shops, if they, a lot of shops will carry, not, uh, not all of them, but uh, it's not cheap for about, uh, five pairs of bronze mallard if they're well paired that'll run you probably six to eight bucks that's expensive <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to if you really want to get into the business of it you go and you buy like a four ounce package that's about three hundred dollars wow and you will go through that and you will probably half of it won't be usable it will be usable if you do the other type of folding on the hackles, but there's bronze mallard is just a little nicer to use than, than um, a lot of the spay flies also use turkey and they also used uh, some goose for wings. They didn't all use the bronze mallard, but oh, it is available. <laughs> In that folded technique, would it be any advantage to apply some cement or lacquer to the very beginning of the fibers? Well, if you were John Oshulski, you'd be shot. <laughs> <laughs> That's from John Page. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you you can uh, along this edge of the fly. Let me switch. Okay, the center edge right along the top here. Occasionally, you know, when you start fishing this fly, it'll separate out. And right now there's a little gray feather there right in here. That's one of the guinea feathers coming through between. You can, if you get them together, you, there's, uh, what you do is you take uh, used to be Dave's Flexament, and then you would really thin it down to where it was just extremely thin. And you would just barely put a drop on one or spot or so, and that would immediately seal those two together. Gotcha. However, it's real hard to get Dave's Flexament and Dave's Flexament thinner now partly because it has to be land shipped. It can't go by air because of the toluene and the, uh, the stuff that's in it. It's very extremely flammable, but you can take shoe goo and toluene that you can get at the hardware store 
and the shoe goo that you can get wherever they sell tennis shoes. Um, and you can mix those down to get the same real thin stuff. The uh, That's a good tip. <laughs> yeah, and, and Thanks, you know, this, this, this healthy hoof, what I do, I took the big bottle like what Sherry had, the larger one, and I took the smaller bottle and I put some in there. And because you, you open and close it and open and close it, it gets thick pretty soon. Well, get yourself a bottle of lacquer thinner. Can you hold that up? Uh, oh, that doesn't have a label on it. No label, not just lacquer thinner. You get it at the hardware store. Yeah. And you can thin the, yes. the new hoof. hoof yeah. Stuff what I do is I, I fill this up with the, uh, with, with, with the thinner and just squirt it in and shake it up a little bit and it thins it back down. Yeah. Well, I'd like you guys to, uh, this, it looks like, um, let me change the view here uh, so I can see all of you. It uh, looks like um, this Zoom thing is here to stay. And uh, as the years go by, uh, think about things that you would like us to present. And it looks like we're going to just keep going because uh, whether whether we're zooming because of a pandemic or whatever, I think we kind of like doing this. And uh, it keeps us from driving in bad weather and we can still get together. So those of you that are local to Sisters Oregon, uh, hopefully uh, we'll have a few face-to-face -face meetings when everybody's uh, happy about breathing in the same room with each other. But uh, the expo is going to be challenged. You can mask or not mask. It's going to be wide open. Uh, and so uh, we're planning. Uh, a lot is going on right now. So if you guys can, uh, if anybody wants to volunteer to help out, we have spots for an hour or two hours, whatever, if you'd like to help out. And uh, that'd be really great. You get a expo pin and six, six uh, raffle tickets. <laughs> it's not a big thing, but it is a lot of fun and you can get in free, of course. So uh, it's open to everyone. And we're gonna have a really, really stellar uh, live auction on Friday night. So if anybody wants any information about that, just give me a shout. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. Thank you very much for being here. There was uh, uh, 27 of us tonight. Woohoo!